Hey guys, today I picked up a new system, and it is an Atari 7800 Pro System. Now this came out in 1986, June of 1986, uh, but unfortunately when this came out, it was actually already two years behind, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, first of all, let's take a quick look at the system. Uh, it's a top load design, you know, similar to a 2600 or a 5200. Um, what they've done is they've made the power button, pause button, select button, and reset button uh, now electronic. So it's just like a push button and it turns on and you push it again and it turns off with a power LED. On the one side of the system we have an expansion interface, uh, which of all things was actually rumored to have a laser disc expansion. Uh, I would imagine games like um, Dragon's Lair maybe is kind of what they were going for with that. Um, here's of course the RF output on the back, and here's the standard two prong, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see that, but it's a little square connection with two pins in it. Uh, unfortunately I didn't get the power supply with mine, and I have modded mine to take a standard like a Sega Genesis power adapter. You see I picked this system up really cheap, I picked it up for ten dollars, and I knew that finding the power supply for it would be next to impossible because of that two pin little square uh, design on it. It's not like a standard, uh, you know, power supply pin, so finding a power supply for this is next to impossible and probably cost more than the system's worth. Uh, so I monitored it with this Sega Genesis jack on it, and now it works with any Sega Genesis power adapter, which of course is easy to find and I have lots of them lying around. And you can still use the official one on it if you wanted to or if you got one, so pretty cool little mod. Now the system's backwards compatible with 2600 games, and uh, that was, uh, you know, one thing that a lot of people wanted uh, was to be able to play the 2600 games without any type of uh, accessory like you did with the 5200. Uh, another thing they changed on this from the 5200 is they went back to a digital controller. Now unfortunately I don't have the controllers for this, but there were two controllers released for this. Um, the one we got over here, and uh, the one in Europe. Now the 5200 controller was pretty unique for the time because it was analog. Actually, had uh, instead of you know digital switches for the uh, joystick, it was uh, completely analog. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it was very cumbersome. It broke a lot, and uh, games would lock up. It just didn't work very good. So in here, they went back to a digital controller. You got your two controller ports on front. Of course, they are nine-pin male, just like your 2600. Now this launched when it came out. It was affordable, and that was another thing they wanted. This was $139.99, and like I said, backwards compatible with all your 2600 games. Now, this system was not actually developed by Atari. Uh, they had like a contract put out with a company called General Computer Corporations, or, C or GCC, and they started development in 1983. The system was complete and ready by 1984. And it was actually released uh, like a test market in Southern California in June of 1984. Unfortunately, the video game console crash, as we all know. People stopped buying 2600s. Uh, you know, the Intellivision wasn't doing so good. It was, you know, expensive, and the ColecoVision was expensive. A lot of bad games coming out for the 2600, and people stopped buying video games. We all know about the video game crash. And, uh, well, unfortunately, that was right around the time this was going to come out. And what actually happened is uh, the new owner of Atari, Jack Tremell, pulled the plug on this thing. They uh, instead decided that Atari was going to focus on upcoming 16-bit home computers. They didn't think anybody wanted home video game consoles anymore. Then, of course, in 1985, the NES came out, and it showed, you know, it showed uh, North America or showed America that people actually did want home video game consoles. They just wanted good ones. And the NES did so well that Atari decided to bring this out. Of course, it was already done, complete two years later and ready to go, 1984. But it didn't actually get full release until June of 1986. Now, the CPU inside here is like a 6052. Very popular 8-bit uh, CPU. Very similar to the processor that's in other Atari 8-bit uh, computers or some of the Apple computers at the time. It's also basically the same processor that's inside an NES. Um, the graphics processor runs a lot faster at 7.16 megahertz. They nicknamed it Maria. 
It was capable of, at the time, a very large uh, amount of hardware sprites. Uh, this could do a lot of a lot of moving sprites on screen at, at, at a time. It had 25 possible colors on screen out of a t total palette of 256. Uh, and it had a resolution of 320 by 240, which is higher than the NES or the Sega Master System. Unfortunately, though, this chip was very hard to program for. And it was also very CPU intensive. And to run a lot of the high color modes, or use a lot of sprites, or to run in that high resolution mode I was talking about, uh, required a lot of the CPU's attention and made it almost impossible to make good games. So, you know, it was hard to program for. And most programmers and developers didn't uh, bother with the higher resolution modes. The biggest uh, downside on this system is really where they cheaped out the most. I mean, the processor and the graphics processor were obviously you know, highly uh, more powerful than the 2600. Uh, but for the sound, they used the exact same TIA sound processor that they used in the Atari 2600. It's like a very basic two-channel sound chip. And uh, it's in here because obviously it's uh, backwards compatible with 2600 games. So, I mean, it had to be in there anyways, but they didn't add any extra sound hardware. So, for the most part, the games sound just like 2600 games, you know, which is that's horrible if you think about a system coming out, you know, I know it's supposed to come out in 1984, even if it came out in 84 uh, or 86, I mean, and it really has no sound improvements over their, you know, model from 1977. Um, to help combat this, um, when they built the uh, 7600, or sorry, the 7800, they did allow for uh, extra sound processors to be put in the cartridges and um, so that would help if you wanted to have a better sound. There is a lockout mechanism in this NTSC version. Uh, think of it like the 10 NES chip on the NES and uh, it was Atari's uh, way to try and combat some of the pirated games that we saw on the uh, 2600. Uh, the other problem with this is obviously uh, you know what it comes down to is the games and the developers and um, there weren't really n any new innovative games on this system um, for the most part anyways for the most part all the games on here were old arcade ports and games that have already been on the 2600 games that have already been on the Intellivision games that have already been on the ColecoVision you know games like Pac-Man and Donkey Kong Jr. and uh, all those Centipede and, and you know Joyce, Joust, sorry all these arcade, uh, older arcade games ported very well to this system. Um, but there was really no games that uh, took advantage of what was called bank switching, something that the NES used um, to allow for an 8-bit processor. And, and most of the 8-bit eight, games before this system, you think of the Atari and the early arcade games, you know, they're very simple, very small, maybe, you know, 2 to 4K uh, size games. And with the NES and games like Mario have these huge worlds, they used bank switching technology and this was capable of it but I don't think any games took advantage of that so all the games were like 2, 4K and they kind of just were these simple arcade games all over again uh, there was nothing new, nothing innovative there was a few platform games on here and I guess some of them were decent but certainly nothing like Mario Brothers you know there was nothing that was you know kicking you in the pants saying you want a 7600 and that's exactly what Mario did so the cartridges look like this. Now once again, it looks like they were trying to save money because all the cartridges, the art on them is black and white. That's pretty cheesy looking if you ask me. I mean, I can understand the instruction book, but I mean, the actual cartridge, the thing you're going to look at most of the time, no color on it. I mean, here's Pac-Man on the 2600, and it's full color. And like I said, you can stick that in there, and you can play that. You can play your 2600 games. Or you can play Miss Pac-Man and enjoy, you know, much, much better graphics, much more arcade realistic graphics. So there you go. The system was pretty decent. Had it come out in 1984 um, and it had the right game, it could have been the, it could have been the next NES. Um, unfortunately, the NES, uh, for one, it had a more innovative controller, and we were, we were happy to see a more compact controller without a joystick on it. Although that's what the European controller was like for this system, the original American controller uh, was still a joystick. And, uh, you know, of course, Mario Brothers was the game to really um, 
want everyone to buy home consoles again. And, uh, you know, this system, like I said, when it did come out, it was already two years old. Um, you know, and no one's really seen what this thing's capable of. You know, under the right, uh, with the right programmers behind it, maybe this uh, would be capable of, you know, some games uh, similar to what the NES could do. Uh, maybe not in the sound, but uh, certainly in the graphics and the gameplay. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we'll never know.